I want you to take your Bible tonight and turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 1. Hebrews and chapter number 1. And uh, I want you to find the first book, uh, first chapter of the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to read three verses tonight. Hebrews chapter number 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. I hope you are uh, continuing faithfully in your uh, Bible reading plan. Um, if you are, then you're going to get a sermon tonight from last week's readings. And you got a sermon this morning from this week's readings. And uh, did David do a good job? Man, what about that? Isn't that something? I, I, I tell people he's the, uh, he's the preachingest non-preacher or the non-preachingest preacher I've ever met. I don't know, whichever way you want to say it. And uh, so I called him yesterday, and, I, I, and it's really strange. You don't even know how to ask him, will you preach tomorrow? Well, you can't ask him that because he's not a preacher. And so I said, will you give the sermon tomorrow? <laughs> it's the way I worded it. And he said that he would, and I appreciate him for that, and he did a wonderful job. Uh, you know, we've really messed the idea of preacher up. Uh, do you know who preachers are? Every single person in this room is a preacher. It really comes from the Greek word caruso, which means to proclaim. And I really believe a lot of the reason why we don't evangelize uh, in the modern church culture is because we bought into the lie that it's the preacher's job. And it is the preacher's job. We just don't understand who the preachers are. There is the office of pastor-teacher. And I feel like that's what God has called me to, the office of pastor-teacher. You ever met a pastor who couldn't preach? To be honest with you, I've known a couple in my life. I'd say they're not a pastor. And that's why Paul uses the word pastor-teacher in conjunction with one another, because you cannot separate. You can't be a pastor and not be able to teach the Word of God. It's a primary function and office of the pastor. And you ask the average rural Christian what the pastor's main job is, they'll say, oh, he needs to visit sick people and solve church problems. Preaching and teaching of the Word of God is oftentimes way down the list. So we're all people who uh, need to be able to proclaim the truth of God's Word, and that's a lot of what I preached on last Sunday morning when I talked about that we all need to be able to give a reason for the hope that is within us. So people would say, well, is David qualified to be up here? Well, it's, it's not a question if you're a preacher. It's a question is, can you teach? Do you have the gift of teaching? And, uh, and that, that's, that's what the issue is. What does the gift of teaching come from? It comes from an understanding of, an ability to communicate the revelation of God. And I, I want to preach a sermon tonight with this title, The Progressive Revelation of God. The Progressive Revelation of God. I planned to preach this last Sunday night, and uh, I saw my father-in-law wasn't having service. I thought it would be a wonderful opportunity for him to come down and preach for us, so I just put it off until tonight. But this is going to be a little bit different. I don't, have, I don't have points per se, but I just want to give you kind of a discussion tonight that I hope will help you to understand just exactly what is the progressive revelation of God. We believe something as Christians. I hope you believe this. God can not change. He is an unchangeable God. By His very nature, He cannot change. He is from everlasting to everlasting. And anything that was ever true about God will always be true about God. People say God can do anything He wants. No, He can't. He cannot change. Because if He could, then He would not be God any longer. God is not a man or the son of man that he should not, God is not a man that he should lie the Bible teaches us in numbers nor is he the son of man that he should change his mind so he is unchangeable but let me tell you this about God though he in his nature and character is unchangeable he does deal with humanity in changing ways 
God has not always dealt with man in the same way or even in the same mediums. The book of Hebrews is a book that can be described and boiled down to just one word. It's a Greek word, kraton. I've said it so many times before that I bet some of you know what that Greek word translated into English is. It is the word better. And the whole purpose of the book of Hebrews, I'm going to tell you what the writer of Hebrews does. He just goes through the entire book preaching sermons on Old Testament passages. He just exegetes the Old Testament. It's all he does. Preaching verse by verse, line upon line through the Old Testament. And here's what he's saying to us. Everything that you read in the Old Testament is good. Everything that you read in the Old Testament is even great. But Jesus is the greatest. Everything you read in the Old Testament was wonderful. But Jesus is the wonder of all wonders. All the prophets were great, but Jesus is the best thing. And he wants us to understand this one idea that Jesus Christ is the supreme revelation of God. But wouldn't you agree with me tonight that before you see these people today, I mean, there's a lot of, there, there's kind of this strain of Christianity that really is growing in strength that says that the Old Testament is, is not important. Charles Stanley is one of my favorite Bible teachers in America, but I'm going to tell you something. His son, Andy, has gone off the rails telling us that we don't have to have the Old Testament as a foundation. It's basically Neo-Marcionism. It's something that they dealt with in the third century after the apostles died, was this idea that there's a God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is not the God of the Old Testament. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, in the Old Testament, God was a God of wrath, but in the New Testament, He's a God of love? No, He's not. He's the same God in the Old Testament as in the New Testament. The only difference about God in the New Testament is that instead of pouring His wrath on you and me, He poured His wrath on His own Son. That's the only difference. But His character is still the same. And so there is a, a, a line of thinking that is gaining popularity in New Testament, in, in the modern American church culture, that we don't need the Old Testament, that we don't have to have the Old Testament. Let me tell you something. Without the Old Testament, the New Testament is not worth the paper it's written on. You cannot fully understand Jesus until you understand what came before Jesus. And I would say to you, and you'll know this if you're in my Bible study on Wednesday night through angels, that not only, was, not only do you have to understand the Old Testament to understand Jesus in his incarnation, but when you really understand the entirety of the Old Testament, you'll find that Jesus is actually on every page of the Old Testament. See, his introduction, his first birthday party is not actually when we're introduced to Jesus, but actually we've already met him in inconspicuous and unseeming ways all throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. In fact, I'd say to you when Moses is walking through the side of the mountain and he comes up on a self-combusting shrub, we call it the story of the burning bush. And the bush cries out to Moses. The Bible calls the voice that cries out to him the angel of the Lord. You know who I believe it was? I believe it's the pre-incarnate Christ. Joshua chapter 5, the Bible says Joshua is standing and he looks across from him and he sees one who is described as the captain of the host of the Lord's army. He's described as the angel of the Lord. And this angel of the Lord looks at Joshua and says, Take your shoes off for the ground on which you stand is holy. Angels don't make ground holy. Only God makes ground holy. You know who told Joshua to take his shoes off? The pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And so the writer of Hebrews says, don't, don't throw away the Old Testament. Understand the Old Testament so that you may gain a fuller understanding of who Jesus Christ is. I never gained a full understanding of who Jesus Christ was like I did when I understood, for instance, the tabernacle. I'll never forget the night Keith Fordham was here. He preached a revival service on a Tuesday night about Jesus and the tabernacle and and, and how God just worked in my heart through that sermon to understand exactly the, the, the work of Jesus Christ in the believer. So, so let's look at these, these three verses. I just want to share with you some, some thoughts from this passage of Scripture. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. 
God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much... What's that next word? Better than the angels. As he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Father, help us tonight to preach with Holy Spirit anointing, and God, give me unction and strength and energy. Uh, Lord, help me to speak with clarity. And Lord, may your word go out and not return void. May it help us to have understanding of your word. And Father, do through this time, I pray that you would just speak through me now. The words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, my strength and my Redeemer. I ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody in agreement said, Amen. I want to speak to you tonight for just a few moments about the progressive revelation of God. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 begins by explaining to us the beginnings of the revelation of God to humanity. God has not told us everything that there is to know about Him, but God has told us a sufficient amount about Him whereby we are able to make a decision about whether or not we will give ourselves over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Romans 1, for instance, makes it clear in chapter 1, verses 18 through 32 that everyone who is ever born under the sun will stand before the Lord one day in judgment, and they will stand before Him without excuse, because God has revealed Himself to every single creature in some way, causing them to be accountable for the eternal destination of their souls. Now, God has revealed Himself to us in some various ways. God has revealed Himself to us, for instance, Psalm 19 says through creation. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. The earth declares the handiwork of God. And so creation describes to us the beauty of God. But God has not just given us this natural revelation, which is what theologians call us, but God has given us specific revelation. God has not just given us a generalized revelation. God has given us specific revelation. And here's the way that God did it. We call it the plenary verbal inspiration of God. P-L-E-N-A-R-Y. Plenary verbal inspiration of God. Now, you need to know that phrase. You say, I don't need to know that phrase. You need to know that phrase. You say, I don't need to know that phrase. Hey, did you hear what I said? You need to know that phrase. P-L-E-N-A-R-Y. Verbal. Now you say, preacher, why do I need to know that? The greatest attack that is facing the church in the 21st century is an attack on the Bible. We don't attack the historicity of Jesus anymore. It's already been settled. Jesus was a real historical figure. Nobody even debates that anymore. It's long gone. Now we're debating the Bible. Can we believe every word? Can we trust every word? And if you believe in plenary verbal inspiration of the Word of God, then you must believe that every word is inspired by God. Now let me tell you what that is. This is what we believe about the Word of God. I just taught this in my New Believers class the other week. We believe that God, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, moved upon men in a variety of circumstances, and in a variety of situations, and he used them in their situations to pin down Holy Scripture. And every single person was not writing in a robotic manner, but they were actually writing in the 
area of their circumstances. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, Paul didn't write like John. That's why people will sometimes say, we know that Paul wrote this letter because the language is Pauline is what they'll say. What's that mean? Sounds like Paul. You ever pick up the phone and somebody says hello and you're like, they don't even have to say another word. I know exactly who that is. Because they have a certain sound, they have a certain dialect, they have a certain language. And that's what we can look at. We can see Paul's letters and we can say this is increasingly Pauline. It looks just like Paul. Uh, Bible scholars say, well, we can look at this letter and we can say it's Johannine. What does that mean? It means it sounds like John. We can tell John wrote that. They look at this other letter over here and they say, we can tell this is Petrine. What does that mean? It means it sounds like Peter wrote it. And so God uses all of these men in the midst of their circumstances, and yet every word that they pinned down is true, trustworthy, and reliable because it was written down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So God starts... Listen, this ought to give you hope. Right here. God starts His revelation with just pure D... Old, common, sinful, rotten men. I mean, they're not perfect. Matter of fact, the first five books of the Bible are pinned down by a man who couldn't even get into the promised land. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. So various times. You could take the Old Testament and divide it up into some, some very clearly delineated sections. First, by, first five books of the Bible, call it the Pentateuch. Moses writes all five of the books except for the ending part where he dies. We just assume that Moses didn't write about his own death, right? Somebody else filled that part in at the end. But everything else in those first five books was pinned down by Moses and it is simply a telling of the early history of the Jewish people. People say, why didn't God write more about the, uh, those first 11 chapters, you know, the creation of the world? Because that was not the purpose of the first five books. The purpose of the first five books were to tell about the history of Israel. Not, not even really to talk about the history of the world, talk about the history of Israel. And so Moses pins down all these things. How does God speak to him? Well, he speaks to him in various ways. Sometimes he just moves upon him through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes he comes down to him on the top of a mountain and speaks to him. Sometimes he speaks to him through a burning bush. I mean, in all kinds of ways, he speaks to Moses, and Moses pins down the words of God as they are given to him under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He speaks in fragments. God didn't come down one day and give Moses all five books of the Bible at one time. He gives him a little bit here and a little bit there. And a little bit here and a little bit there. And, and sometimes he has to even give it to Moses twice, right? Because he gets mad, he comes down to the bottom of the mountain, he chunks his fragment of laws, and he's like, doggone it. Got to go back up and get them again. And so he gives, it, gives them to him in fragments. But there's some things that we can unequivocally say that are true about the way that God spoke. Number one, there is this reality that it was God who was speaking. Clearly. Secondly, God spoke to the forefathers, the patriarchs. He gives this message to them clearly and without misunderstanding. And thirdly, God speaks through the prophets. Go to the end of the Old Testament. You'll find men like Hosea, Ezekiel, Malachi, all of these various people. God is speaking to them in a variety of ways. He's speaking to them through visions, through dreams, through all kinds of different things. And as He is speaking to them, God is, these men are pinning down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the entirety of the Word of God. God deals with men in a variety of ways. There is a, a lot of controversy today about this subject, but I think it's, it's one that really you, you, you can't argue with, and, and it is the subject of dispensationalism. Now, 
I think a lot of people get carried away with dispensationalism. Uh, but what's the old saying? You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Y'all never heard that before? I mean, that's not even from my generation. That's from y'all's generation. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, so what does it mean to say uh, dispensa- what, what does that mean, dispensationalism? Well, that's a word that's found one time in the English Bible, dispensation. What we, what we mean when we talk about dispensation is that God works in a variety of ways in, in a variety of times through a variety of means. Now, I, let, me, let me give you this one time. Now, you all know I'm never wrong, right? How many, of you know, how many of you know this is true about me, that I'm never wrong, at least in my own mind, right? Amen? All right. Let me tell you about one time I knew I was not wrong, and I was determined to prove my professor wrong at Shorter. He was an amillennial, uh, anti-dispensationalist. Amillennial anti-dispensationalist. Somebody's got the live stream on in here. I can hear myself repeating myself. Okay. I, I just, I knew I heard myself talking what I said two minutes ago. I, I didn't know. Anyway, all right. So, uh, dispensationalism. So, here's what he said. He said, dispensationalism is not real. There are only two covenants. There's the old covenant and there's the new covenant. Now, I agree that you can get carried away with this thing. For instance, I always tell people all the time, I say, if you want to understand the end time, study the Bible. Don't read the Left Behind series. Right? So we can get carried away with this stuff. Here's what I asked him. He said, dispensation is not real. I said to him, I said, do you believe that God dealt with men in the same way before the fall and after the fall? He said, no. I said, do you believe that God dealt with man the same way before the flood and after the flood? No. I said, do you believe that God dealt with man in the same way before the law and after the law? No. Nope. I said, I know you agree with this one. Do you believe that God dealt with man before the cross and after the cross in the same way? He said, no. I said, then you know what you are? His face got red because he, he, he saw I'd walked him right into it. I said, you're a dispensationalist. Now, you say, why do you tell me all that? God has dealt with people in a, pri- in a variety of ways, primarily through covenants. But every covenant that God ever instituted only pointed to one thing. One thing. So do you notice here the writer of Hebrews spends one verse telling us about how in past times God spoke through the prophets. And then immediately he makes this hard right turn to tell us this, but he has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Perhaps the maddest the Pharisees ever got at Jesus was when he said to them, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Perhaps they never got more angry with him than at those moments in time in his ministry when he claimed equality with God. How many of you in here would just be honest and say that there are a lot of times in your life when you long for the good old days. Raise your hand. Just be honest and raise your hand. You just say, I just I miss the day when Walter Cronkite was still on television and Dick Clark still did New Year's and not Ryan Seacrest. And you know, you just Waited for the next episode of Bonanza to come out. and You know, you, you just miss those days. You miss the days where even Democrats were 
semi-not insane, right? You know, you just, you just miss the good old days. Well, can I tell you something? You would identify with these people that this writer of Hebrews is talking to because he was writing to a crowd of people who always was longing to go back to the good old days. What were the good old days? The good old days was the Old Testament. They really didn't understand that those good old days wasn't all that good. But for some reason, they just could not grasp the fact that anything other than God speaking through the prophets could be reality. But the writer of Hebrews says, but now God is not speaking through His prophets. God has spoken to us through His Son. And he gives us some characteristics, some qualities of this son. Number one, he tells us that this son who God is speaking to is the heir of all things. What does that mean? It means ultimately everything in this world is under the control of Jesus Christ. How do you know that? Look one chapter later to Hebrews 2, 8. You have put all things in subjection under His feet. Who's the He? The He is the one that was made a little lower than the angels. That's Jesus. He came in the incarnation to become a man who would die for our sins. And God has rewarded Jesus by putting everything under His feet. He is the heir of all things. That means everything is included in His inheritance. Then look at what He says next. Not only is He the heir of all things, but He also made the worlds. See, this is why we believe that Jesus is the pre-incarnate Christ, which means that He did not have a beginning, nor does He have an end, because the Bible clearly states here that Jesus was actually present in creation. In fact, you read the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, you'll find that He says, let us make man in our image. So either God is schizophrenic and He talks to Himself, or there was a group of people involved in creation there in the beginning. Right? And I would say to you that clearly the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are in unity and are working together in the means of creation. And then look at what he says next. He says not only has he made the worlds, but he is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. means when you look at Jesus, you see the spotless, perfect, pure reflection of the very God who we long to stand before one day, just merely veiled in flesh, not to keep you from being able to see the full thing, but to keep you from getting killed by the whole thing. Jesus is the expressed image, the brightness and the radiance of the glory of God. And the Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 9 that he, this light that Jesus was, this express radiance of God's glory, John tells us this in chapter number 1 when he calls him the light, that he shines into the hearts of humanity. And though he came as a humble baby born in the side of a cave in the midst of farm animals of humble means, the Bible says that even still the darkness could not comprehend or overcome or overtake him. Why? Because he was the radiance of God's glory and nothing can dim the light of God's glory. And then he goes a step further and he says not only is he the radiance of his glory, but he's the express or the exact image of his person. Exact image. So that's why Jesus says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so what I want you to understand about the progressive revelation of God is this, that all throughout the Old Testament, you're getting parts and bits 
and pieces of the revelation of God. He's letting you know a little bit about Him. And I'll tell you one of the greatest ways you can do this. Have you noticed this throughout your Bible reading? I hope you're noticing this as you're going throughout the Old Testament. You're constantly encountering these various names for God. Constantly encountering these different names for who He is. Uh, I don't even know who we were discussing this with uh, the other night. I was, uh, maybe it was last Sunday. I don't remember. We were talking about Hagar. And, uh, and the fact that God gives us a characteristic of who he is in the story of Hagar. You go over to Genesis 22 and Abraham and Isaac and the story of them going up on the mountain. And the Bible says in chapter 22 verse 14 that he's Jehovah Jireh. The Lord shall provide on the mountain of the Lord it shall be seen. And you're going through all of these Old Testament passages. And, and all that God is doing for you is he's adding another piece of the puzzle. And every time you turn a page from front of your Bible to, towards the back of your Bible, God is giving you another piece of the puzzle, and He's letting you know a little bit more about who He is. Blows my mind how people can call themselves Christians but never crack the Bible open. I mean, my goodness. How could you call Him Savior and not want to know something about Him? Yeah, He saved my life, but... Maybe I'll meet him one day. And you have an entire book of information that God has given to you so that you might know who he is. But he's just giving you bits and pieces. But then, out of nowhere, God says, I'm not going to give you bits and pieces. I'm going to give you the exact express image, the exact representation of who I am, and I'm going to do it through my only begotten son, who is Jesus Christ. He is the divine expression and the exact representation of the Father. And it, it is a clear expression of his deity to say this. This is what the writer of, of Hebrews is saying here, that Jesus is God. Now, now to, these, to these Old Testament absorbed Jewish Christians that this Hebrew writer is, is writing to, this is, this is hard for them to grasp. I mean, you say, well, I don't, I don't understand how hard it is to grasp. Well, imagine you've been taught something all of your life, and then somebody comes into the equation and says, I'm God. Might be a little hard for you to understand too, right? I mean, you ever see the stories on the news? Guys who walk around in white gowns and long hair, and they say, I'm Jesus, come back to the earth. You know, you ever see those stories? They're always weird stories like that. Uh, maybe just the places I read. I don't know. Nobody else reads those. But anyway, uh, yeah, you look at those people like they're nuts, of course. And that's what a lot of these people did. They had a hard time grasping onto that. For us, we've been taught this all our life. It's common knowledge. Jesus is God. For them, man, it's difficult. But the writer of Hebrews says, listen, if you'll ever grasp onto this, it is better than what you've always known. Because Jesus is God in flesh. The writer of Hebrews is saying to them, Hey, you remember that presence who was behind the, the, the veil? You remember the presence that filled up the Holy of Holies that was behind that veil? Hey, this is Him. Jesus is God. And he tells us that He's not only the express image of His person, but He's upholding all things, I love this, by the word of His power. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Have you ever, and you may not do this, but, but things like this just totally, totally fascinate me. You know, there are people in society who still think the earth is flat. Did y'all know that? There are still people in society who think the earth is flat. And some of those people may even be closer to you than you realize. But imagine the first time that the astronauts went out to, into space and they took a picture looking back towards the earth. I mean, how awestruck they must have been. Have you ever looked at, at a picture of the earth from outer space? And you know, the first question you've got to ask is like, where's the base at? Like, where's the pedestal this thing's sitting on? And you look around under there, and you're like, nothing under there. 
Now, the Greeks had their explanation. They thought Atlas had real big, strong shoulders. He'd done so many military presses that he was able to actually uphold it on his own shoulders. The Bible says there's actually a different explanation. That this universe is suspended out in space with nothing underneath it. And it is upheld simply by the words of His power. He is the sustainer of the world. I love what the writer of Hebrews called him in a later passage of Scripture. Hall of faith is what we call it. Hebrews chapter 11, all these great Bible characters. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Verse 3, I love this. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Woo! If you're waiting to believe in Jesus until you grasp that, you'll be waiting forever. That's why he begins that verse with, by faith. What's he say? God took things that were unseen. There was no matter, there was no time, there was no space. And God made matter, time, and space. You go home and bake a cake, you've got to have some raw ingredients. You build a house, you've got to have some raw materials. You put together a car, you've got to have some machinery. Some motorization. God takes nothing. And He makes something. Only God could do that. Not only does He make it, but He sustains it. And He's the only reason that this thing ain't in more chaos than it already is. Let me give you two more phrases, I'll be done. Upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had by Himself purged our sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels. What did He do? The Bible says that Jesus purged our sins. It means He removed the stain of sin. It was an act of grace that had no merit. We had done nothing to deserve it, nothing to earn it. God removed our sins through Jesus Christ in a sheer measure of good will. So these Hebrew Christians might have looked at the writer of this book who we don't know, and they might have said, what, what makes Jesus so much better than those Old Testament prophets? What makes Jesus so much better than the Old Testament priests? What makes Jesus so much better than the Old Testament tabernacle? The writer said two things. Number one, he purged our sins. And then he ascended on high and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, there's th those, those things are two different phrases that cannot be separated. Why, why cannot they be separated? Because here's what the writer of Hebrews would have looked at these people and said. He would have said, you remember how in the Old Testament, how you would go up to the burnt altar? You'd make a sacrifice for sins. They'd say, yeah, yeah, we remember that. And he said, you'd be clean, right? Yeah, we'd be clean. He said, then what would happen? They said, we'd break the law again. And what'd you have to do? Had to find another lamb without spot, without blemish. Had to go back to the brazen altar. Make a sacrifice. And then what would happen? We'd be clean. But then what would happen? We'd do it again. Break the law. We'd have to find another lamb without spot, without blemish. Every day we had to do it. And he said, so you're telling me the priest never sat down? Oh, no, the priest never sat I mean, I'm telling you from the sun up to sundown, he was up on his feet. Matter of fact, we found that he stood ministering daily. 
performing sacrifices that would never permanently take away our sins, Hebrews 10. And the writer of Hebrews said, well, listen to this. Jesus has purged your sins. He has purified you of your sins. And he's done such a doggone good job of it that he's ascended to the right hand of God the Father and he's sat down. You know why he sat down? Because he's done. Now me, I, I, and I know Kenny's like me because we were talking the other day. that uh, Kenny, how long have you been working on that fence? It's been a while, three months, and you just, you know, you, you work a little bit on the fence, and then you come back later and you work a little bit on the fence. Listen, I've got about ten tasks that my wife's been telling me to finish, and I just, if I can just, get, I just inch it a little bit forward until I can pass, just pass the fire a little bit more, just inch it a little bit forward, you know. Just clean that bottom room up a little bit, just make it look like we're at least moving forward. Just put one more piece of vinyl siding on the side of the house, just so you can at least say, I'm closer than I was yesterday. That's how I operate. But Jesus, oh no. When Jesus sets out to do something, he don't stop until it's done. And Jesus sat down at the right hand of God the Father, never to get up again until it's time for him to bring his church to heaven with him. And you know why he sat down? Because it was a job well done. He did such a perfect job that it did not ever need to be done again. And the writer of Hebrews said to these Hebrew Christians, why would you ever want to go back to a system like that when Jesus Christ has given you this hope? And so let me just say this, and I'll be done. Throughout the Old Testament, God revealed himself to the prophets. Luke 1, 2, Luke 1 and 2, Jesus Christ comes into the earth. He's a little baby born in Bethlehem. The writer of Hebrews calls him the express image of God, the revelation of God to men. Jesus Christ is the revelation of God. God speaks through his apostles from the time Jesus ascends up into heaven until about 95 A.D. when the last book of the Bible is written, John the Revelator is what we call him, writes a book of Revelation around 95 A.D. He's the last apostle, still alive. What makes an apostle an apostle? First things, you had to, have, you had to see Jesus. John's the last one. He's the only one who does not die a martyr's death. Most people believe he just died of old age, though he was exiled to Patmos where he wrote Revelation. Wrote the last book of the Bible in Revelation, and that's it. That is the progressive revelation of God. God revealed himself through the prophets in the Old Testament. God revealed himself through Jesus in the Gospels. God had revealed himself through the apostles in the letters, the epistles, the book of Revelation. And this is all there is. It is complete, it is sure, it is reliable, it is steadfast, and it is steady. And it can be depended on for everything that we need in this life. I really believe this book is the answer to all of our problems. And God is not revealing himself to us like this anymore. I I love what one person said, said, If you want to hear God speak, read the Bible. And they said, if you want to hear God speak audibly, read the Bible out loud. Everybody's looking for God to reveal himself to them in in all kind of miraculous and supernatural ways. And God's saying, boy, you've got a whole lot of material there you've still yet to master. And before asking for anything new, maybe you ought to just settle on what you got and get that right. And then one day, there'll be some more revelation. I believe there'll be some new revelation, Brother Billy, when Jesus steps out on the clouds and calls us home. Be some new revelation when we enter into heaven. Be some new revelation when we come back to earth with him and we uh, enter into the millennial kingdom, then we enter into eternity with him. I believe there'll be great revelation, but for where we're at today, God's given us a whole bunch of good information that we need to live this life. Here's what the Bible says to us. We've been given all that we need for life, 
and godliness. Everything we need is here. God has revealed it to us progressively throughout time. And now we are the most blessed people in the world because we have not only the fullness of the revelation of God, but we're surrounded by the biggest cloud of witnesses that has ever been known throughout history. See, I don't love just to read the Bible. I love to read about uh, characters throughout church history who were faithful to the Word of God. Even men who were imperfect, like Martin Luther. Real smart guy, had some bad flaws. John Calvin, real smart guy, had some bad flaws. Charles Finney, real smart guy, had some bad flaws. The Puritans, I love reading them all. We're surrounded as people in the 21st century in 2020 by the greatest cloud of witnesses that has ever been known. We're so blessed to have all the material that we have. Not only biblically, but extra biblically. People not only who wrote the Bible, but people who wrote about the Bible. But can I tell you something? Modern Christians are dying, and I don't mean this as a harsh term, but I mean this seriously. We're dying as some of the dumbest people when it comes to religion. I mean, we've got a biblically illiterate society. We've got more material about the Bible, but we've got less knowledge about the Bible than we've ever had in our churches. That's sad. That is so sad. A lot of it is from apathetic empty, hollow preaching. But a lot of it is just from laziness in the hearts of people. Man, we got to get a hunger for the Word, as Peter says. A, a deep hunger that can never, ever be satisfied by just a sermon here and a sermon there, but by a daily time spent alone with God in His Word. Father, we love You. We thank You for revelation. Father, I thank You that You have revealed Yourself to us. And God, that you have spoken through us in a variety of ways, in a variety of times, through a variety of people, but ultimately we see the fullness of your revelation through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for revelation. God, you are not silent. You have spoken clearly to your people. And we thank you for it. Thank you for Jesus the express and exact representation of our God in heaven. Now he has returned to sit at the right hand of the Father on high because the work is done. Now we need only believe and follow. Believe and live a life of imitation. Lord, as we seek to follow in your footsteps, not only did you come to this earth to show us the way to redemption, but you showed us the way of holiness God, I'm reminded of the passage that David just preached on this morning. You were tempted in all points like as we are, yet you were without sin. God, you were beset by every type of temptation, and yet you never once failed. And you showed us the way of holiness. Lord, help us to take your life and use it as a model. That though we cannot be perfect, we certainly can strive to be perfect. God, to avoid sin, live holy for the glory and the honor of your name. To live every day in the light of the revelation that has been given to us. That you have revealed yourself to us through the creation. and You have revealed yourself to us through the canon. But God, ultimately, you have revealed yourself to us by sending your own Son to this earth. Yes, veiled in human flesh, but still 100% God. Thank you for sending Jesus. And God, help us to live every day in light of eternity in the center of your will. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.